We have a very special guest, Steve Forbes, chairman of Forbes Media, former presidential candidate. We'll be talking about the future of the economy, the future of media, and a new series that Mr. Forbes is launching called the uh, Steve Forbes Achievement Series. Welcome to the David Lynn Report. Good to be with you. Thank you. Honored to host you, Steve. Good Steve, to be here. let's talk first about the economy. Now, you've done a number of panels here, the latest on inflation, which I attended. Very uh, interesting talk. The root causes of inflation, what struck me as interesting is all these different panelists that I saw had different explanations as to what caused inflation that we saw over the last two years. What is your explanation? Uh, well, there are two things. One is the shutdowns. When you shut down production, print a lot of money, yeah. uh, you're going to have a distorted economy. And we also learn, the authorities learn once again, that if you interfere with one part of the supply chain, uh, all the other pieces that get to discombobulated. So uh, that uh, sent up prices. Then, two, the Federal Reserve created uh, too much money, uh -huh. uh, lowering the value of the dollar. So that impacted things as well. And so in terms of uh, the lockdowns, what they should do, and uh, they're putting in a lot of regulations which are going to make things more difficult, right. but let the economy heal. Uh, after World War II, for example, the U.S. had to convert from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. Prices went up because rationing was ended. Price controls were ended. Takes time to go from making tanks to uh, refrigerators. Yes. So for a couple of years, things were uh, really uh, disrupted. Uh, but uh, the dollar was kept stable. Taxes were cut and the economy boomed again. Here today, the Federal Reserve believes the way you fight inflation is not keeping a stable value for the dollar, but rather hurting the economy, slowing the economy down. They want more people to be unemployed. They don't want wages to go up very much. Uh, which will mean impoverished people. Yeah, that'll bring prices down, as we're seeing already. You know, but uh, that's not the real cure for inflation, because once the economy starts to boom again, uh, they're going to weaken the dollar, which will put us back on this treadmill. So stabilize the dollar, leave the economy alone, and the American people will do just fine. Do you think had the Fed not raised the interest rates by 500 basis points, inflation would not have come down five, from 9% to 3%? Uh, it would have come down if the Fed knew how to fight inflation uh, by uh, stabilizing the value of the dollar and not printing so much money. And uh, so, uh, but uh, the reason they raised the interest rates was to, uh, they thought the way you would control inflation is by depressing the economy, sort of like what medicine did a little over 200 years ago. Sure. Uh, they, when a patient got sick, they bled the patient. Yeah. Of course, that got rid of the pain and suffering because it got rid of the patient. And so... Uh, that's what the Fed, uh, that's in the mode they're in right now. So, yeah, inflation's coming down. So is the economy. There was a time when America grew at 4 or 5% real GDP per annum. That's no longer the case. It's much lower than that. People were even talking about negative GDP, GDP growth, possibly, uh, for the next recession. When or how do we get the economy back to long-run growth that we've seen in prior decades? Or is that even necessary at this stage in the economy? Of course it's necessary. Of course you want it's not just growth. Uh, it's also a higher standard of living, higher quality of life. You go back to the 1920s, booming decade. Uh, our houses were replaced by indoor plumbing. Uh, cars proliferated as never before. Uh, people had an electric iron instead of having putting over fire where we get a lot of burns and everything. So you want that kind of uh, expansion. And the way you do it is the way, we, the way you've always done it in history. That is low taxation stable currency, and not putting on crazy rules and regulations. We've done it before. Are you still an advocate of the flat tax rate? The flat tax would be great for the economy. Uh, right now, the code is, uh, when you include all the rules and regulations, it's over 10 million words and rising. Nobody knows what's in it. Totally corrupt. Yes. And so uh, experts of the IRS tells us we spend $6 billion hours a year filling out tax forms. We spend two to three hundred billion dollars a year complying with this corrupt monstrosity. The IRS doesn't know what's in it, so uh, why not go to a single rate system? I used to say bury the tax code, but the EPA probably wouldn't allow that because it's so toxic for the soil. And 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 uh, a family of four with a flat tax would pay no federal income tax on the first fifty three thousand dollars of income. When you get rid of all that kind of junk, what's not to like? 
Would the flat tax rate decrease or increase government revenue from taxation? Well, you have a more prosperous economy. The government's going to get okay. a cut. I see. And uh, uh, I believe the new revenues should go to reducing people's tax burdens further since they're creating the resources. Yes. But uh, that's a battle still to come. Do you think that a recession is coming, if not already here? Uh, we're going to have the economic equivalent walking pneumonia. Oh, wow. Uh, not uh, not enough to put you in the hospital, but uh, you're not going to feel very good about it. Right. So uh, the economy is very resilient if they just would leave the thing alone, i.e. leave people alone instead yeah. of uh, putting on these oppressive rules. My goodness, what kind of government is it that wants to make dishwashers can't do a load within 10 hours? <laughs> what? Why, why do they want to take away our gas stoves? Why do they want to do away with the pizza in New York that's uh, cooked, cooked with uh, wood or coal? Right, right, yeah. This leads to our uh, discussion about uh, the Steve Forbes and Achievement Education Series. How do we promote more entrepreneurship in the country? I think you do it not by preaching it. You do it by stories of people who in lives exemplified it. And that's what this series is about to uh, people, three-minute biographies with a free market lesson of people who've created in a positive way the world we live in today. For example, our handhelds, which are really supercomputers, once would have filled the size of this room. The supply chains that made this uh, possible was because of containers. Containers were invented by a man named Malcolm McLean, a trucker, Back in the 1950s, said, why am I driving a truck a long distance, having to wait hours at the dock to physically load stuff on a, on a, on a freighter? Why not put the truck, in effect, on, 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 on the ship? And so he redesigned the ship, designed the containers, which met fierce resistance from unions, from, uh, from uh, ports, and eventually it came through and it reduced shipping costs by 95%. Mm-hmm. Here we're, here, we're here in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. This is the home of a play, uh, man called Clarence Saunders, who invented the supermarket Right back in 1916, Piggly Wiggly. Back before then, you wanted to buy something at the grocery store, all products were behind the counter. You gave the clerk an order. He'd write it down, negotiate the prices maybe. He came up with the concept, Saunders. Why not go into the store? Everything's open on the shelf. Prices are all listed. So you take a bureau in the store, take the basket, put the goods in the, in the basket, then go to the checkout counter. And also, he trusted that you'd pay for what you took off the shelves. So uh, it, it empowered consumers, uh, made, made shopping experience uh, much, much more uh, uh, proficient, and also uh, led to impulse buying. Yeah, uh, trying to figure out in advance and writing it down. You go and say, oh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll have that. These entrepreneurs that you've profiled in this series, what do they all have in common in terms of character traits? What have made them successful? As you know, most startups fail. Why haven't they failed? Well, a lot of them did have setbacks, okay. but, uh, but uh, they also had uh, the, the drive and the freedom and the ability to try something new that uh, wasn't uh, seen as uh, common. And that's what it is. It's about economic freedom, the ability to create ability to try, maybe fail while you're learning. Malcolm McLean, for example, when he was successful with the container, sold his company, right. dabbled in some other businesses, then decided to go back into the shipping business. He raised a lot of money, but his timing was wrong. He bought too many ships and he went broke. Uh-huh. So it's like, you know, no guaranteed success. And so, and so uh, he was doing another business, starting another business at the age of 87, when he died, yeah, and on the day of his funeral, container ships around the world stopped in the in the oceans, tooted their horns in honor of the man who created that industry. How do you feel about the age of entrepreneurs getting lower and lower as a startup culture thrives in America, and uh, and and technology is now the focus of many startups for younger people? Do you think that? Younger people, if you were to give advice to younger people, should they work first for another company or jump straight into be And on your own, uh, your own choice. We're yeah. not all the same. Right. Uh, many, the average age, actually, of an entrepreneur is 39. Most of them have come out of large companies. They see something, something that's not being done, and so they start their own business. So, uh, yeah, the focus is on young people. 
but it covers all ages. As Yogi Berra, the great late ball player, liked to say, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> so whether, whether you're young or old, uh, you may try it. It's not the life for everyone, but uh, you should have the freedom to do it. And so if you're, if you're not a big success by age 21, don't think you're a failure. And you also, you learn as you go. Steve Jobs was fired from his own company because he was such a poor manager before the before the age of 30, they booted him out. Right. He painfully learned how to be a great leader, how to bring teams together, motivate them. That wasn't, uh, you're not born necessarily with that. You learn. That's what young people should uh, take inspiration from. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have everything when you leave school. You're continuing to learn. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a stumble, big deal. In this country, it's not a stigma. You get up and you try it again, take what you learn and move forward. Mm. Finally, I'd like to talk about a sector that is dear to both of us, media. How has technology changed the face of media over the last 40 years? Oh, boy. Everything I learned about media seemed to be thrown out the window with the <laughs> rise of the Internet. <laughs> the model that had been existing since the 1840s. Was how has the, how, how the Internet impacted Forbes in particular? Well, uh, we were once uh, primarily a print publication. That's right. We uh, would come out 26 times a year, probably uh, publish about 1,000 uh, articles, 800 articles a year. Uh, we still do some uh, issues each year, uh -huh. but most of our uh, content is online. We now have 2,500 contracted contributors writing for Forbes.com on various areas of their expertise. We post over 100,000 items a year. Same goal, helping people who want to get ahead, but a very, very different model on how to do it. Have your demographics changed with the advent of the Internet? Uh, demographics, uh, probably a little younger. Yeah. And uh, But we have uh, features like 30 under 30, uh, people, young people around the world under the age of 30 doing great things in a variety of fields. 50 over 50, Yogi Bear again, not over till it's over. You can still, still, still do it. Right. Remember Ray Kroc, who invented uh, the idea of a nationwide or worldwide restaurant chain, right. McDonald's, didn't it didn't it didn't hit his stride until the in his fifties, back in the nineteen fifties, which equivalent for uh, in terms of ages, yeah, probably about sixty five today. How do you make the thirty under thirty or forty under forty the coveted list that everybody you 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 apply, yeah, and uh, make make your case, and, okay, and we take it from there. Oh, you have to apply. You don't. Yeah. The, the editors don't select people based on. Uh, oh, they 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 select, but you uh you got to. Uh, oh, I see. Eat. Yeah, I see. Okay. Broadcast media. Do you think cable is dying? Uh, cable's under pressure right now, and we'll see if uh, it can adjust right to 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 the new world, and. Uh, uh, Industries often adjust. Uh, we talk about uh, shipping. Uh, once upon a time, passengers traveled by boat. Yes. Across the Atlantic, across the Pacific. Then along came aircraft, especially jet aircraft. And so the passenger ship looked like it was going to go the way of dinosaurs. And a whole new industry rose up, cruise ships. Right. Uh, for, for tours, not for uh, going on business from one destination to another as in days of old. Yes. But tours. Bigger than ever before. Old industry, new application. What well, one one emergence, uh, well, one new emergence in the world of media is a concept of citizen journalism, where if you go on a Twitter space, for example, anybody can host a space and have potentially thousands, if not millions, of listeners. These may not be people with professional broadcasting or journalism backgrounds. 10, 15 years, 20 years ago, you had to have had the infrastructure to broadcast as that many people. Now all you need is literally a phone. What are the pros and cons of this trend? Well, Democratic, yeah. Uh, you don't have to uh, go through a gate gatekeepers anymore. You can try it yourself. But also, too, as we're learning, uh, it may it raises the noise level. Sure. Yeah. And uh, and uh, you have to uh, learn to uh, adjust to uh, what 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 you think is true. It may shows the importance of brands as never before. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, doing 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 that, but also it also emphasizes you have to have something unique to say. Now, some people try to. Uh, sensationalize it, saying, you know, uh, the dinosaurs are coming back or the earth is about to end or, you know, we're going to fry or freeze or whatever uh, to get to get clicks. But people are looking for a trusted uh, brands that they know they can go to and rely and be able to trust the information they get. Uh, based on the comments I've seen online, there seems to be an erosion of this trust towards mainstream media in particular over the last few years. First of all, is that something you've noticed? 
Well, unfortunately, a lot of the mainstream media does not bring the same skepticism and same reporting ideals that uh, did a couple of the 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, where you try to report a story instead of uh, seeing, seeing yourself as an advocate for something. Right. Or, uh, uh, and so you don't get the kind of in-depth reporting. That's where the opportunity for somebody going online doing some real reporting is wide open. A lot of the traditional media doesn't do that. Well, what, what happened in the shift of attitude here? Why, 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 why was this, this change? Uh, good, good question. And uh, maybe it was the uh, intensity of the politics. They, they, they felt that the world was uh, under threat. Uh, they uh, wanted to uh, put themselves more out there instead of uh, seeing their job as a chronicling what's going on instead of uh, trying to uh, shape what's going on. Yeah. Final question. Uh, if you look around the world, what is the biggest threat facing America today? Is it the threat of foreign powers? Is it domestic turbulence? Is it uh, Ultimately, there are some very real threats out there, very serious ones, but, but ultimately it's internal, psychological. Mm. And I think uh, what you're going to see in the next few years is a resurgence in, in, in the nation. We had bad periods before in the 1890s, very, very real question about where this country is going, the 30s, the 70s. So I think uh, we're, 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 go, we're ready to uh, move again. And I think you see it in the uh, great new things coming out of health care. I think you're going to get a different environment next year where you can actually eat a pizza that you like and, uh, and uh, have air conditioning that works, dishwashers that work. And uh, so the election's going to be very important next year. I don't think we're going to go to the European Museum Economics where uh, there's stagnation, a lot of pretty sights, but not the kind of dynamism we want here. Are you going to run for president again? I'm an agitator now. <laughs> Excellent. And where can we watch your new series, Steve Forbes on Achievement? Where can we At uh, access it? At I-Z-Z-I-T okay. dot org slash Forbes. All right. We'll put a link in the description. Honored to have hosted you today. Good, 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 good to see you, and uh, please call me Steve, and uh, good luck on your new venture. Thank you, Steve. All right, thank you for watching. We'll stay tuned for more.